over to you, Sam. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Munawa. Uh, good morning to everybody in the UK and good morning, good afternoon to everyone in India. Uh, thank you very much for participating in this UK India pipeline stimulation activity. The twin themes that we have of enabling connectivity and environmental sustainability and climate resilience are brought into somewhat stark uh, uh, focus today as we're battered by uh, Storm Dudley in the UK, where connectivity in all its forms are important to life and work now and increasingly so in the future. And this is clearly what today is, is about. And it's also about finding solutions to address uh, environmental sustainability and climate resilience. So thank you very much everybody for joining. Uh, next slide, please, um, uh, Manua. I'm sorry, this is going to be a witty mo moment throughout this uh, as we uh, move the slides forwards. But yes, so there's, there is some housekeeping. You've all been sent a pre-event survey, which hopefully everybody has completed. But there is also going to be a post-event survey. Uh, and this will return to this at the end, and I'm sure Patrick will, will talk about it at the end in terms of this is how we want to that we are taking things forward. So it's really important to complete that post event survey. And all of us here who have been involved in this don't want this to be just another Zoom meeting to actually start business and academic activities between India. So that is our mechanism for engaging with you going forwards in terms of taking things forward. Um, so put any questions in the chat and we'll um, try and answer them at the end of the uh, event. Uh, the event is being recorded, uh, as you will have heard. Uh, and if people want slides, uh, we need to uh, obtain agreement from the companies involved in things, but um, those could be made available. So the next slide gives you some of the timings for what's going on today. Uh, and I will try and keep it to time, but we have some introductions to the various organizations that have been involved in uh, making this happen. Uh, and then we will move on to the particular challenges themselves and uh, the feedback that we've had from uh, Indian stakeholders. And then we will move on to um, a number of um, show business showcases from UK companies who have technologies that are addressing the twin themes that we're talking about. Uh, and then Patrick will uh, address the issue in terms of next steps and how we take this forward. Uh, so I will try and keep it to time uh, because we've got people, um, a large number of people uh, in the UK and uh, in India involved, uh, so I'll try and uh, move things along. So next slide please, uh, Manuel. So um, a brief introduction to, to Quantex Solutions and myself. Um, so. Uh, through Context Solutions and my knowledge of precision uh, livestock farming and business skills and some um, rather too long experience in terms of working in this area, I assist um, agri-tech companies to innovate and grow both in the UK and overseas. Um, I became involved in this because recently I was also contracted as a specialist to the Department for International Trade in the agri-tech team where I worked with Dr. Elizabeth Wareham, who you will hear from later, who is the head of the Agritech team within uh, the Department for International Trade. So in this project, I've been working alongside the Satellite Applications Catapult, AgriEpi, colleagues in DIT, Department for International Trade, Innovate UK, both in the UK and overseas, to undertake this pipeline stimulation activity. So we've had several workshops prior to this where we have, before, well, before the workshops, we've spent some considerable time in terms of trying to engage with farmers and businesses and investors and academics in India and also in the UK uh, in terms of um, uh, informing us in terms of what are the challenges and what are the opportunities with, within India. So that's uh, a brief introduction from myself. And uh, the next, um, if we could move on to the next slide, please could I introduce uh, Callum Kelly, who is the Agritech lead for uh, the Satellite Applications Catapult, and he is going to give you a brief overview of their role in, um, 
end this. Thank you, Sam. And, and uh, next slide, please, Manuel. And uh, welcome everybody to um, this event and, and thank you for all the organisations here to present today. We really couldn't do this without you, so thank you. Um, my name is Callum Kelly. I am the Agritech Lead at the Satellite Applications Catapult. And the Catapult is um, a world leading innovation and technology company, partly funded through the UK government, uh, with a vision to innovate for a better world empowered by satellites. So we are representing UK space capability and do this by collaborating with industry, not competing with it. As a result, we are neutral and work with governments, industry, NGOs, academia, to pull through the capability of space and satellites to deliver game-changing results to markets like agriculture and the food and drink sector. Next slide, please. And so for me, that essentially means identifying the opportunities to link space and agriculture. So we work in many countries around the world, including India, which supports our vision of a globally resilient agriculture sector supported through UK satellite enabled products and services. And we do this through a very agile method to enable customers to truly understand their needs and help them identify if and how satellite enabled products and services can be part um, of a solution to their challenge. So whether that's a large farming company like Barfoot's and sharing technical expertise of how space can help them reduce food wastes along their supply chain, right through to developing demonstrators and proof of concepts, which eventually become their own entity away from the catapult, like Ocean Mind, a company which monitors illegal fishing around the world for customers like supermarkets. Uh, next slide, please. And the benefit of working with the Catapult is that we are neutral and we can convene the right partners um, appropriate for the opportunity. So this means we have worked right across global value chains from trialing weed zapping robots to countrywide land use assessments. Space has a role in benefiting the system as a whole with satellites enabling part of the solution. It goes without saying that collaboration is key and it's very clear that the agricultural challenges we face today require collective solutions, a broad understanding of the market and an open-minded approach as to the best, most suitable solution to that challenge. So I'd now like to hand over to my colleague Patrick to talk through one of our approaches we take to identify these challenges and opportunities. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you, Callum. Uh, next slide, please, Manoel. Thank you. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Callum said, my name is Patrick Stewart. I'm an international business analyst and lead for the Catapult Pipeline Stimulation Programme here uh, in the UK. Um, so the Satellite Applications Catapult uh, PSP, Pipeline Stimulation Programme, is a, a series of international activities designed to identify uh, long-term strategic opportunities for innovation and future impactful collaboration globally. Uh, these activities encompass discovery exercises to identify the opportunities that are in country, be it commercial, research or academic, that could be addressed through joint UK international collaborations to deliver prospects for UK and in-country organisations globally. So, what I'm going to go over the next couple of minutes is just the, the background for how this activity in India sort of came to be and, uh, and, and what we're uh, at what who's going to be talking after me and what the plan is going forward. So this started uh, last year um, as a phase one discovery exercise, which was initially designed to identify uh, the themes of interest uh, within the Indian market for health and agriculture. And we undertook interviews and desk research to better understand what application areas are important uh, within this specific market. We're now in, in phase two of delivery, uh, where we've seen activities step up quite significantly. And we've begun to validate those findings from those interviews and through that desk research with key stakeholders, um, uh, through workshops, which our colleagues at AgriEpi and Quantech Solutions have undertaken for us, uh, to start to identify the more granular opportunities with those key stakeholders. So who has the problem within those identified thematic areas? 
Um, this bilateral event, which we're conducting today, will then present our findings back to the UK and respective markets so that you guys can better understand what opportunities exist within the Indian market for, for agriculture. Uh, following this, we'll be sending out a post survey to gauge interest in the areas discussed today, which will help us to build a roadmap for engagement and activities for the next 12, 24 and 36 months. Phase three is kind of a catch-all where we then look to support in-country engagement and really start to kick off activities in earnest, which will include UK organisations, as well as Indian stakeholders and organisations, and projects as well as recommendations for new programmes for delivery. So in summary, the aim of the PSP is to enable the identification of areas of opportunity in the UK, uh, for UK engagement, apologies, to generate awareness of areas of complementary uh, activity for positive interaction, to enhance visibility of stakeholders and states of importance in country, and to improve visibility of the key supply chain and sector needs. If you would like to know more about the Pipeline Stimulation Programme, then please do reach out to me after this event. And uh, I'm now going to hand over to colleagues at FDO, at FCDO, to outline the importance of these activities in India and what they're doing in country. So I hope you enjoy this activity and this session today. Thank you for listening. And I'll now hand over to Daniel Rocco. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, a lot. thanks a lot for that, Patrick. Um, my name is Danny Rothberg, uh, and I am Deputy Head of the Science Team here in the British High Commission in India. Uh, let me first introduce you to what the Science Team here does. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we facilitate collaboration between research centres and universities in the UK and India, and we also connect innovative UK expertise with international opportunities. As part of this, we work very closely with the UK Research and Innovation, who are a non-departmental public body sponsored by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and most excitingly, are the UK's largest public funder of innovation. And in India, those innovation opportunities to connect are vast. My colleagues and I work in fields as diverse as health, agritech and the fourth industrial revolution. But most excitingly, I lead on space. India is a space superpower and HM government have funded the catapult, as Patrick has said, over the last couple of years to look at the use of satellite applications in more granular detail and help build the UK-India bilateral relationship on space. The future of this relationship will be shaped not just in our respective countries, but also in the cosmos. India has a proud and innovative history in space exploration since the launch of the first sounding rocket in 1963. And the UK, home to Stephen Hawking and Jodrell Bank, is, the, is India's natural partner. And this is something that both prime ministers have highlighted in the 2030 roadmap for India-UK relations last year. Momentum is building. In 2021, the UK launched a groundbreaking space, space strategy, and we also hosted the inaugural UK-India space consultations. And the pace will continue throughout this year with two commercial spaceports expected to open in the UK. Ultimately, space plays a critical role in our daily lives. Satellites orbiting the Earth above our heads keep us connected, storm doubly aside. They support our present and future security prosperity, enabling us to navigate the oceans, keep our troops safe, monitor the climate and forecast the weather. The space sector is also a vital part of the UK economy worth over 16.4 billion pounds a year and implying, employing over 45,000 people. The global space economy is projected to go from about 270 billion in 2019 to almost 490 billion by 2030. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson challenged us to turn global Britain into galactic Britain. Your conclusions that come out of this project will help secure this. So thank you for listening, and I will now pass over to Elizabeth Warham, who leads the Agritech team at DIT. Thank you again. Thank, thank you, um, Danny, for the introduction. Um, I'm Elizabeth Warham, and I lead the Agritech sector team within DIT, working with posts overseas and with stakeholders in the UK to help companies export overseas and help you overseas investors invest in the UK. Next slide. Next slide. 
So we cover for agri-tech any um, technology practice or innovation around the productivity and sustainability of agriculture, whether it's arable or livestock, horticulture, aquaculture and forestry. We also cover on-site storage and processing, both of food but also non-food products, whether that's um, fuel, fibre or pharma products. And we cover care, welfare of pets and horses. And as you will see from the livestock supply chain, that can be technology in different parts of the supply chain, whether it's the genetics of the livestock, whether it's aspects of welfare, or whether it's technology for husbandry and looking after the animals. And then also that leads to innovative and different types of natural products. Next slide. So what's so important about the UK agri-tech sector? Well, it, we have three specific strengths. We have world-class science. We also have a progressive um, food and farming supply chain, whether it's the farmers uptaking innovation or whether it's the consumers um, trialing new different food products and therefore increasing the demand for innovation across the supply chain. We we'll also provide a dynamic business environment being easy to do business in Europe, making it also a very strong R&D innovation ecosystem. Um, I've highlighted here five of our high potential opportunities, which illustrate some of the strengths that we have in the agri-tech sector, from controlled environment agriculture in North Yorkshire, Leeds, plant science for nutrition in Norfolk and Suffolk, animal health, Surrey and North Hampshire, precision agriculture in Telford and aquaculture in Dorset. These are the main focus areas that we um, focus on in terms of overseas investment, but we are reactive to other opportunities. Next slide. And a key part of the innovation ecosystem was the um, UK strategy for agricultural technologies, which was launched in 2013. And for that reason, the team was established in DIT to support the sector. But also another key action was the establishment of the four agri-tech innovation centers. And you will hear from Lisa later in the program. And these have been critical in um, setting up the connectivity between business and the science. They've developed 55 new innovative world leading facilities across the UK. We work in DIT, work very closely with them on international engagement. And there are three overseas smart farms to support commercial research in Paraguay, China and New Zealand. And we're looking to develop further that network. Um, you've got AgriEpi, Precision Agriculture. You've got AgriMetrics for data. You've got CL for livestock. And you've got CHAP for crop health and protection. And there's a satellite smart farm network across the UK, which we're linking into the international network proposed. Next slide. I'm just highlighting here some of the diversity across four themes of the different types of companies that we have that have been growing and developing and starting to export overseas. Of note on this slide is Ace Aquatech, which has an award-winning electric stunner which reduces fish stress and improves productivity by stunning fish while they're still in the water. And Clean Tech, which is a water purification system to remove the medicines from treatment water. Next slide. An area which is growing rapidly at the moment and particularly as a result of the pandemic and as governments look to develop national security programs and ensure that uh, food is more local is the whole area of controlled environment agriculture. And this is where crops are grown in a situation with the environment under complete or partial control. And that can mean the medium, it can mean the water, the nutrients, the atmosphere and the light. It can be in glass houses, but it can also be in other buildings. And we see the development there of vertical farming, which is a practice of producing crops in vertically stacked layers. And I've just highlighted here some examples of the companies that are developing different types 
of growing systems. Some provide the complete growing system, like intelligent growth solutions, Liberty Produce, the closed growing systems. You've then got Jones Food Company, which designs, builds, and even operates the system. And then you've got Saturn Bioponics, which focuses on the hydroponic science and the technology and their towers can be used within existing um, glass houses. Next slide. Also crop post harvest is an area which is developing rapidly. We see that a third of food produced um, is lost in transport and storage. And there are new mechanisms looking at how to develop the cold chain more effectively to protect the crop as it transports um, and also storage. We've got Martin Lishman that has sensors that mimic the travel of the crop in a truck and can tell how much damage may have impacted on that crop as a result of temperature and uh, jogging along the, along the road, etc. We've also got clean new um, transport systems, trucks, which have been profiled by Sainsbury's, um, the Dearman engine, which works on liquid nitrogen. And then there's other mechanisms and alternative cooling technology to replace um, energy requirements from shore chill and also solar polar. Next slide. And lastly, just to focus back again on livestock, we have the, the genetics, um, pig genetics from Dearman Park and uh, pedigree, Deer Park pedigree pigs, and also um, Cogent, which has sex semen technology helping to prove productivity of dairy and beef as a whole development around nutrition for livestock. And then also um, some companies helping to facilitate and improve production of poultry. Next slide. I'm now going to explain a little bit about the services that um, DIT offers to help companies. Um, in this case, it's about helping businesses export overseas. There's a lot of initiatives which are available through the great.gov UK website. Of notable development in the recent year is a new export support services, which provides end-to-end -end services for business exporting to Europe. And that will be grown and expand to other countries worldwide. We've also got an export academy, which is very new. Um, that's offering bespoke training program and digital tools to help businesses learn more about how to export. And there's also a pilot trade show program um, with grants to attend an event um, initially as a visitor and then a second grant to be part of a UK pavilion at one of the UK's um, trade shows. We've also got um, teams, international teams, located in over 100 gro 180 global markets. And then last but not least, there is um, UK Export Finance, a credit agency available to help and support companies exporting. Next slide, please. This just highlights where those offices are located. Um, DIT is usually hosted in a British embassy alongside FCDO team and um, obviously with the former um, Department for International Development. Now within FCDO, there are some countries that focus quite uh, strongly on the overseas development angle. And I've just listed a couple of contacts in India um, working for DIT. Next slide. And for those uh, overseas investors that are looking to invest in the UK, DIT provide and um, supporting stakeholders, the investment services team provides support to those investors. My team provides the technical support and then we work with investment service team providing the logistical support. We're available to help um, make connections to the right partners to um, develop visit programs as appropriate. Next slide. So in summary, what do we have to offer? Um, it's a very diverse sector. It does vary by region. 
We are world leading in animal plant science research. We also have the four agri-tech centers which offer value for companies to create business, access innovation grants and trial new technologies. And we are a very strong tech giant. And we're here today a lot about the, um, the space opportunities and how that is transforming agriculture. I've just put in some general indication of where opportunities exist with India. Um, obviously the digital space, a horticulture, precision agriculture. There's a lot of development in many countries overseas on the sustainability agenda and how do we um, make agriculture more profitable with less impact on the environment as animal welfare, as we in strengthen the traceability of our food systems. There's livestock nutrition and aquaculture. Next slide. And lastly, I'd just like to highlight a new development um, which we've been working with the trade associations and also with the four Agritech Innovation Centres. And this is the Agritech UK portal. It started off as um, profiling companies that are looking to export. So if there's any companies on this call that haven't signed up to the portal, please do look at it and please do sign up. It's an opportunity for you to have some marketing and profile with commercial officers overseas and other potential partners. It does also um, include four capability statements around livestock, horticulture, agricultural engineering and um, companion animals. We're developing one around um, the cold chain and crop post harvest at the moment. We're looking to expand this with capability of the centers of excellence and universities. So watch this space. There will be uh, more information available there. We also currently have events listed with missions where DIT will have a presence overseas and where there's an opportunity to find support for that export journey. Next slide. Thank you for listening and please find my contact details here on this slide and look forward to hearing from some of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth and um, Danny and um, Patrick and um, Callum. Uh, Danny and uh, Elizabeth, thank you very much for your support throughout this uh, project and things. That's been exceedingly welcome. Um, and, and to your teams who have been involved in uh, in that as well. Um, so we're, we're now moving on to um, the part where uh, we're going to talk about the outcomes from the workshops that were held uh, at the end of last year. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, Lisa Williams, who's uh, popped up just above me on my screen at least. Um, so Lisa is the uh, business development director for um, AgriEpi. Uh, previously, she worked for the con well-known consultancy Promar and where she was uh, um, head of Agri. So um, Lisa, thank you very much. She's going to give an introduction to AgriEpi and then move on to the, uh, the first workshop that we held on uh, enabling connectivity. Thank you very much. Over to you, Lisa. Great, thanks, Sam. First of all, good morning, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to present to you all today. I'm going to start with a couple of slides to provide an overview of the AgriEpi Centre and some of the work that we deliver. And then I'll go into some more detail with regards to the, the outputs and outcomes from the connectivity uh, workshop that, that was held at uh, the end of last year. Next slide, slide please. So about AgriEpi Centre, we are funded by Innovate UK and we exist to bridge the gap between the, the people, the companies that are developing and creating new innovative um, ag technologies and those that benefit them. So you'll see on the left hand side of the, of the, the middle of the, the picture, we've got the farming and ag challenges and it's about how do we understand what those challenges are on farm and throughout the supply chain. 
And we have a network of farmers that we engage into to, to understand better those challenges. And we also have a range of members throughout the supply chain that we're also able to communicate with also. And on the right hand side, we've got the ag tech solutions. So as a result of the ecosystem that's been developed in the middle, we're able to ensure that tech solutions are delivered to the marketplace that are really addressing those challenges. In terms of what we have, we have a range of incubation hubs here within the UK, one in Edinburgh, one in the Midlands, uh, Harper Adams University, one at Cranfield, which focuses on soil. We've also got a Southwest dairy and we've also got aqua facilities as well. But we have incubation facilities to host companies, to provide support to them. Uh, we have engineering space, as well as bays, offices and, and conference facilities. We have a range of technical expertise. So the AgriEpi colleagues are, have worked in the sector, they understand the sector, and we also have some um, technical capacity as well. We have a range of controlled test facilities, and this would include a uh, phenotype and gantry that we have at, um, at Cranfield, looking at soil health, structure of plants, really looking at validation tools of, of a range of ag tech. Um, we also have a Southwest Dairy, which um, houses 180 dairy cows and again can validate a range of, of technology within this sector. And we have the 24 UK commercial farms that Elizabeth's already referred to. So actually there's a correction there's now 25 because we've just had one join um, our network which is based in Wales it covers all sectors and it's key to, to, to um, it's a key point just to say that epi focuses on engineering and precision and innovation but we cover all sectors whether that be from livestock to arable to high value added to, to poultry dairy we cover the whole se sector but it's a ha it's about how best do we really enhance the sustainability of the supply chain through precision agritech? How do we make life easier through the use of agritech within our sectors? And with these 24 farms, again, we're able, 25 farms, we're able to validate a range of technology, really understand and hear from farmers who are going to be using that technology in the future in terms of what works, what hasn't worked, what, um, what the price points, what needs to be amended, um, really hear from, from those farmers. And there's a couple of companies that are actually engaging within the network um, at present on a couple of trial sites. We also have a range of field and lab solutions where we're able to take it out into the field rather than being, being static within our facilities. And we've also got a range of international um, test and demo farms, which Elizabeth already referred to. But I've got a slide next, which I'll, I'll go through with you. Um, we also have a range of services to really help support those businesses in accessing funding. So we're able to provide support on um, writing, supporting on uh, funding applications and really bring in supply chain partners together. Um, we have a range of um, uh, members. We have over 200 members within, within our network. And it's vitally important because this covers uh, software, hardware developers, engineers, farmers, supply chain operators, those other allied industries that are able to support the companies as well. So I'd also recommend you um, to have a look at some of those membership um, benefits and really look at how we can really grow and develop that, that network further. Can we move on to the next slide, please? And I'll focus on um, international smart farms. So this is a slide that I've taken from Elizabeth, um, but within AgriEpi, we have developed three international smart farms. These have been in China, Paraguay, and New Zealand. And in fact, in China, we've had a couple of, of smart farms. And the idea is really that we've developed a platform by connecting UK tech businesses with international players. 
And this allows that platform to integrate a range of technologies, whether that's from the UK and perhaps connecting with Chinese companies. It's about validating the pr proposition in country. It's about showcasing the usability and value. And that's using the, the farm and connecting with a wider farm community. It's about connecting those tech solutions with the farmers, the key decision makers and the buyers, and also not to forget the importance from um, government stakeholders and really driving forward the, the brand that, that we have within the UK. And Elizabeth's already provided an overview on the ag tech that is developed within the UK. This also cre creates an opportunity for increased farmer adoption. And we're also able to raise awareness of the technology that's available to them. And hopefully for the companies that are involved, we're able to promote sales within that supply chain of their agri-tech. So as I've said early, earlier, smart farms cover all sectors. And you can see there an overview of the sectors that we cover. And below it, you can see the areas that we want to, that Agritech can help address. And it's important to note that when we first link in with a, an overseas partner, with a farmer or government representative, or from um, supply chain operators, we really want to understand what their challenges are on their farm. So we can really bring that into the, the ag tech that, that's de developed. And this is the whole purpose of, of of this workshop. Um, but the areas that's covered is data and compliance, productivity, could be labour shortages, irrigation, water, animal health and welfare, and, and there's a range of other areas there. We do, however, recognise that the funding for these activities has been very much stop start. And it's also how do we engage the international satellite smart farms in with the UK satellite farm network? How can we use the data how can we better inform ourselves? How can we better improve um, farming? How can we really um, improve the, the yields? And with that in mind, we, um, AgriEpi, Innovate UK and DIT has established an industry steering group to allow us to really tap into additional funding and to drive forward further activities. So you can see there that this group is chaired by Agco and there's a range of, of other companies there. But if anyone is interested in learning more on that, please don't hesitate to, to contact us. We really wanna hear your views in terms of how we can really um, engage with overseas markets and get Agritech connected with these marketplaces. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next few slides, I'm gonna be focusing on the work that we have delivered on behalf of the Satellite Application Catapult. Callum, and Patrick's already provided an overview of how we've ended up with the theme that we have. I'm going to focus on the connectivity workshop that was held in December. My colleague Claire, who you will hear from shortly, will cover the outcomes from, from workshop two. Next slide, please. So just to recap in terms of what do we mean by connectivity? And again, Claire will go through um, workshop two. But in terms of connectivity, we're really looking at the enabling of connectivity of actuator and sensor devices. And it's also um, looking at enabling sustainable and profitable supply chains through robotic systems and sensors. And this was really looking at post-harvest as well as logistics. So it's actually a wide ranging topic um, and this will show with regards to the wide range of stakeholders that, that also at attended. Next slide, please. So participants, you can see that there's, there's a wide range. Um, we had 13 to 15 attendees um, at the online um, workshop that was facilitated by, by Zoom. And insight was captured um, via a mirror board where we were able to really um, drill down and, and get some depth of understanding in some of these areas. But you can see in terms of the participants here that they really did cover um, a range of companies from large to small, 
um, the public sector, universities, finance companies and consulting. And you will see when we go through the challenges um, that um, have been identified, this really does fit in with the, the, those that attended. Next slide, please. So in terms of challenges that were identified, you can see that we've really themed these across different areas from labour, the environment, technology, productivity and quality and storage. So just to provide um, some further details on that. So within the labour, challenges included difficulties in land ownership, really slowing the deployment of ag tech into, into India. And also it's a very large market and therefore slows the, the, the percentage of spread of agri-tech. And we need to prove the technologies across many farms before they are accepted. So the opportunities are trainings needed, and farmer welfare, but also that is a need, there is a requirement for technology within this marketplace. Looking at productivity, challenges, few large farms, very much smallholders, looking at um, access to, to finance, there's low productivity, low yield, cold storage has, has also been, been a challenge, crop security, we, we covered this as well, uh, linked with land security and, and finance in terms of cost of credit and having non-exportable quality, really, how do we drive value back into that supply chain? Opportunities, therefore, provide access to landing, uh, lending focused on small farmers, the lack of credit to smallholders also. Moving on to the environment, challenges include high pressure on water usage, about understanding who uses the farm, who is the decision maker on those farms. And again, linking very much to the structure of that marketplace and smallholders. But again, opportunities link with what, what is the, um, about understanding water usage, how can we optimize its use? How can technology really play a part there and need better monitoring and linked in with technology um, there's difficulties within the marketplace with regards to stealing crops and, and products, um, needing to be able to prove that the technology works, and that's very much linked into a couple of the other areas that we've referred to. And solution is providing small solutions rather than taking it at large scale, so really demonstrating a range of technology. And it's already been mentioned by Elizabeth, but quality and storage is really important. Um, we've mentioned challenges and you're going to hear from some UK companies that provide um, some um, provide technology to, to address some of these challenges, but they include grain storage um, issues about un the underinvested, they need government um, change, uh, cultural change within the marketplace, how, did they, uh, how can we adopt new technology? This cold storage you need to provide cheaper power to be able to maintain that, that storage. Monitoring for security is needed and very little food processing. So how do we add value back into that supply chain? Next slide, please. We then looked at who are the users of the technology and what are the barriers to adoption? So looking at who the users are, it's very difficult to to really address um, who all the who all the users are, and it, there's very different classes of farmer, and there's very new entrants, and it's about really understanding who we need to market technology to, um, owners who want to enter agriculture, technology companies, there's workers, there's farm managers. Um, there's large farmers doing that their own farm. It's about really understanding the, the structure of that marketplace. In terms of the barriers to adoption, it, we looked at a wide, wide uh, country um, challenges, and it's about really driving through that value and getting the right price for their products. It's about getting faster agricultural advice and really understanding what's happening within that marketplace 
right, scalability. And again, you're going to hear from some companies today in terms of use of the cloud and use of a range of different technology. There's um, having farm specific information and advice now. Finance came up all, uh, on a number of occasions. Um, it, it's not been flexible, and that could be a barrier to really adopting technology within this marketplace. Only larger farmers get loans, and we did talk about the structure in terms of um, it being very smallholder driven and how can we really provide that access. Um, mobile technology will um, be able to break down barriers to, to innovation. And we also spoke about, about finance. Next slide, please. So what are those business needs in further details? There's agronomic, storage, credit and finance, water usage and security. And I feel we've covered um, a number of these areas on the previous slide, but looking specifically at a range of technology. So for agronomy, so it's looking at weather and soil information for planting, pest and disease monitoring, GPS steering technology, connectivity derived fertilizer, and digital yield and soil mapping. Storage, very much looking at the infrastructure and the regional storage. Um, looking at connectivity from farm across the storage network and throughout that supply chain as well. So it's connectivity throughout and transparency of that supply chain. It's about utilization of sensors for environment assessment, but also for, for quality assessment also very much linked with assurance, connectivity, and blockchain. Again, linked with transparency of that supply chain. How do we drive that value through the supply chain, through utilizing Agritech? There's low electric use for storage, so that will impact on coolers and heat pumps, et cetera. How, how do we work around that? Security was, it was a key area. How do we um, keep the crops secure? How do we asset tag animals? How do we ensure what's planted is, is, is planted? It's really about looking at the quantity of crops in storage, digital mapping. Moving on to water usage, there's methods um, and techniques of irrigation, irrigation control, reducing the soil water, um, evaporation, how do we get the best out of um, the, the assets that, that are, are there in terms of, of water usage. Credit and finance, again, we've I've discussed this over the last couple of slides, but how can we use technology such as mobiles for finance, looking at risk assurance, monitoring and reporting of that, using digital solutions that, that's available or can be developed to build trust within this supply chain to really enable the investment and finance of the tech but also providing that quality within the supply chain and it's about reconnecting the supply chain overall next slide please i will now hand over to sam who will provide uh, and facilitate the company showcase, but hopefully that's provided an overview on the key findings from the workshop that was undertaken. And in summary, there's certainly a need for UK agritech within this market. Thank you, Sam. Brilliant, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Um, uh, thank you very much for covering the uh, en enabling connectivity uh, workshop that we, um, that we held. Uh, so we're moving on to um, the uh, company showcase um, section to do with the enabling connectivity theme. Um, and uh, right across uh, both um, themes, we have some uh, really interesting, innovative companies who are going to talk about um, their businesses. It's been really, um, really interesting to see the presentations that uh, Eric is just about to present but uh, the others as well further on so please may I introduce um, Eric Hewitson who is the business development manager manager for Wild Networks over to you Eric thank you very much and um, yeah yeah thank, thank, thanks very much so yeah just a, a, a 
talk uh, about Wild. We're, we're a connectivity company for the Internet of Things. We're based in Cambridge in the UK, uh, and we have developed um, a technology that enables uh, connectivity of ag uh, agricultural sensors um, via low Earth orbiting satellites, meaning that we can get data from anywhere on, on the planet. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we've partnered with, with uh, Utilsat. Utilsat are, are one of the three largest satellite companies in the world. They're putting up a, a network of low Earth orbiting satellites. Uh, and by that, I mean you know, shoebox sized satellites that are quite, relatively speaking, in the satellite world, low cost to, to, uh, to launch and, and, and uh, to put up an, uh, a network of these satellites. Each one of these satellites will, will traveling at 25,000 kilometers an hour, about five or 600 kilometers up in the sky will revolve around the earth um, multiple times within a day. And in so doing cover uh, every, every uh, part of the earth, fly over every, every part of the surface of the earth in that 24 hour period. So one satellite can give you 100% global coverage. Now, at, at the moment, the, the, the earth has something between sort of 15 and 20% cellular coverage, you know, mobile phone type cellular coverage, uh, so, so how do you connect your, your, your farms and your agricultural areas, which are usually remote and not in these areas, uh, not always in these areas that have cellular coverage, how do you connect them? It's really, really difficult to do unless you put in, you know, very, very high energy um, satellite connections or you put in very uh, infrastructure heavy um, uh, sort of setups in order to, to get data off your farms. Uh, and what we know in the UK for sure uh, and I'm sure this applies in India as well, is that, that uh, there is a massive under digitization of, of agriculture. There just are not anywhere near enough data points for um, coming from, from crops, from, from moisture in the soil, from water flow, uh, from, from hundreds of different possible readings, humidity, temperature, and all of the rest of it. Um, how do we get all of that data from all these new array of different sensors that are being uh, created out there? And we think we have that that, that kind of the glue that kind of connects the sensors on one end via satellites and gets the data get the data down into the sort of applications that that farmers um, and supply chains need to use in order to um, to you know get them the right information so that they can reduce the sorts of inputs that they're putting in reduce the water that they need for farm uh, for for crops optimize the the um, delivery of that water to crops. For, for example, reduce the, the pesticide and insecticide usage where they can uh, increase yields uh, and have better control over the supply chain. Um, so th that's what we've developed. And you can see in this diagram here that we've, you, you have a soil moisture sensor underneath the crops connected to, to one of our devices, speaks directly to the satellite. And it can do this incredibly low power. So by low power, I'm talking, you know, a couple of AA batteries lasting five or 10 years, sending, you know, hourly or daily data um, of, of temperature points, small amounts of data regularly being sent um, and, and building up that sort of data lake, that, that pool of data over time that can, that can give you the kind of insights that you need in order to make the right sorts of decisions uh, to, to improve farming, improve sustainability importantly, of course, as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a, a, an example of one that we're working on at the moment with Bayer uh, in, in, uh, in the US and in Canada and in, in Germany. So we've developed a, a, um, a lid sensor for beehives. We're trying to make a, um, well, Bayer are interested in finding out this relationship between um, the uh, human interaction of a beehive and the health of the hive, the weight of the, the, the weight of the hive, the temperature, the humidity of the hive, all of these things coming together difficult to get that data when the when the when the hive is outside a, a cellular range so we've um, we've developed the sensor and the and the connectivity to take all of that data up into the, into the cloud um, so so that it can be used and you know obviously this is going to be a massive aid to um, you know potentially for pollination globally um, and, uh, and 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 where, where it's where, where you're in remote locations and it's really hard to get that data um, and it can reduce the number of times that people have to visit sites, so that can reduce carbon footprint um, as well. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview of how that how that might look. We've um, our solution is 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 a hybrid solution, so it means that you can you can connect if there is a terrestrial um, network available. We use a technology called LoRaWAN, which is which is super low power. Um, 
uh, as I mentioned, but it also has it can send send wireless data wirelessly over, over a, a quite quite a distance, obviously up to the satellites, but even across the Earth, it can it can go, you know, 20, 20 kilometers or so um, to, to send data. Uh, and, and you can switch between these two things. So if you're in the supply chain scenario um, and you're trying to sort of, uh, you know, even from from farm to fork, you're trying to track uh, the quality of your produce through throughout that journey. Sometimes you're going to be in an area where you've got signal using using um, cellular networks um, or Wi-Fi or whatever it is. Sometimes you're going to be out of out of range of that. And how do you get data off in those situations? So this is a known problem across the supply chain. You know, something that's become incredibly critical and important over the last couple of years. Uh, and we think we have something that can work really well with that. And we've partnered with with uh, Senate in in the U.S. Uh, track ashore as well and uh, ourselves and utilsat together to try and solve this problem uh, and provide ubiquitous connectivity um, at low power and at, at a very affordable rate as well so that's essentially what we're doing connecting all of the devices all of those um, um, sensors and different types of sensors in the agricultural world to the to the platforms that people need to see that data uh, and we're providing that glue in the middle Back to you, Sam. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. That's brilliant. Um, uh, really good description of um, use of uh, enabled and uh, connectivity. Um, so that was uh, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, Chris Knight, who's the CEO, C CTO um, of AgriBot. Uh, and um, he's going to describe uh, his solutions in uh, this area as well. So over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Hi, Rob. Thanks for coming along. Uh, I'm Chris Nat. I'm the founder of Agribot. Agribot blends data from satellites, AI, and IoT, uh, and we have our team spread across three continents. So we're looking to build a blended picture of what's going on, so we don't miss anything. A bit about me reveals why we focus on what we do. I, I studied AI robotics way before it was trendy, about 20 years ago. Uh, I then spent many years working in space defense, building various satellite systems to then finally uh, then move over to agriculture. And I re researched how weather patterns can be used to predict multi-seasonal crops for my PhD. And now I'm also work, uh, founded Agribot to combine all these things and try and help farming become more precise. Next slide. Um, just a quick overview of why we do what we do. Uh, I love Earth observation, I love IoT, but they do have their weaknesses, hence why the blend. Earth observation is great uh, at, at well, well, observing large areas, uh, but it really focuses through an anomaly detection lens. It does have a few drawbacks. It's not so good at diagnosing issues. It's good at spotting issues, but it can't you can have a guess why the issues are there, but it's not often good at telling exactly why. You have to be careful because some Earth observation da data sets are affected by weather, such as clouds. They tend to get in the way unless you use more advanced satellites. Uh, we get around that by having our own bespoke model to fill the gaps so that data can come from various satellite, uh, satellite systems, some that aren't affected by clouds, as well as other data sets that we get our hold on and create a blend. I'll, I'll go into that a bit more in a bit later. IoT is great uh, because it's very, really good to get, get good uh, data to do some real diagnosis, but their drawbacks are, well, hardware is tricky to scale. Uh, getting the hardware out there and in the ground is a tricky task. There's also maintenance issues, keeping it running while it's out there, especially in remote areas. And it can sometimes cause interruptions to farmers. So you, you typically don't want to do IoT over large scale areas, but that's wonderful because Earth observation and IoT really complement each other so we can use the two, te the two uh, technologies to cover each other's weaknesses. So what we do is we use Earth observation and our blended data to do anomaly detection, to figure out what fields are doing what, and then decide where to really put the resources and focus them, whether that's IoT or an agronomist or someone to go and actually diagnose a problem. So they're not having to squirrel <laughs> chips all over all the fields. And uh, next slide. Um, a few insights that we do uh, before going to our use case. We help uh, governance policymakers and NGOs validate where what areas are growing what crops so we can detect very early on on exactly what's being grown in a specific area. We are helping standardize about crops are measured so by building this blended data so we don't we have maps without gaps, so to speak. Uh, so we're not having patchwork data uh, coming on from different sources. We can also even detect what farming practices have been used to help encourage farmers to use more regenerative processes. 
and even then introduce subsidies that nudge them to use the correct, uh, the better ways uh, that don't really require government funding or policy changes, which is really below bar of entry to help regenerative farming. This data can then also feed as part of a credit score to enable uh, financing by, hold, by small scale farmers. Uh, and it does so because we really keep a, a focus on the price point using satellite data. We do this because we can scan, say, the whole of India in about 60 minutes. It's a highly efficient system. Uh, we use highly efficient computer science to get through it, which really drives the cost down, which is why we can keep an eye on subsistence farmers and really provide a solution that a price point that suits everyone. If we go to the next slide, I'll go for a quick uh, use case and a project we have in Malaysia. Uh, five minutes is not enough for me to blab on about how much we actually do, but I thought I'll focus myself on a use case. So if we go to the next slide. Here, uh, it's a bit of a graph. Stick with me though, it's not as bad as it looks. We have, what we're seeing here is you see two different colors, three three types, uh, three fields. So we're looking at, oh, sorry, we're looking at two fields. The lighter, the lighter colors, so that's the lighter blue and the lighter greens are actual fields. The darker line is an average over many thousand hectares. So we can get an idea of what's going on. The reason we do this is this is how we do our, our normally detection. We compare how the field's doing historically versus how it's doing regionally. So that's how we can detect which fields are going wrong. And the reason I put this in is because if you just use standard off the shelf satellite data, such as NDVR, which is well used, I don't hate on it, but just to show its weaknesses, if we go to the next section, this is where we suffer from clouds, this big massive gap where there's absolutely no data, that anything could be happening here. Uh, NDVI suffers from it. So if you look at uh, our data points, you see we still get data coming in, which is va um, validated by further data points when NDVI finally kicks in. If we go to the next point. NDVI also didn't pick up these yield losses. So these are, which we know in the field, lost yield at these particular points. And if you look at the small dip in the light, uh, the light curve uh, underneath the yield loss, NDVI didn't pick that up. It didn't pick it up on the other points as well. So NDVI thought everything was rosy. Towards the end, it started to catch up, but uh, it was really, it missed, it missed the ball here. Uh, NDVI has lots of short, has lots of great things, but has lots of shortcomings. But again, this is re-emphasizing how having a blended uh, map without gap model really helps to keep an eye on exactly what's going at all times and pick up issues that other specific indices might not pick up on. If we go to the next one, and this is one. So as we can see that this was a weather event or a, a change in um, water on the ground. Uh, that again, NDVI didn't pick up, but the, the blended one did. If we go to the next slide, just to wrap up. So in short, we minimize the cost and practical virus precision farming. We always focus on the small holding farmers. Our philosophy is if we get working there with no internet at low cost, it's easier to scale that up to bigger growth. So we really focus on getting our tech working in all areas. What I did mention in the last graph is after we've detected the anomalous fields, a huge part I just missed out, uh, once we've detected the anomalous fields, we then use our edge AI technologies, again, focusing on low infrastructure areas. These edge AI models work on a device that costs about hundred pounds and it can be powered by a solar cell that can easily power a phone. In fact, a phone takes far more power than this sensor does. So we can use edge AI to make on-site decisions without internet, with very low power need, uh, so that the smallholding farmers aren't losing out uh, just because of bad infrastructure in an area. So again, emphasizing that we focus on driving the costs down, our solutions we use to create farming subsidies with legislative changes or government money. We're trying to standardize the way all this data is gathered so it can be shared amongst everyone properly. Um, and that's it. Thanks for your time. Chris Knight, <laughs> Agribot. Thank you very much, Chris. That's great. And um, it's great to see the combination of different technologies together. And um, that's um, always been my thought that that must be the case and things as we um, uh, as these things go forward. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so it's um, uh, moving on to uh, Robin Sampson, who's the CEO of Trade in Space. And again, sort of following on from Chris, great to see um, Robin's presentation, uh, a real live example of uh, what they've been doing uh, uh, in uh, the coffee sector. 
Over to you, Robin. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, well, I'll move straight into the, the real content that we have today um, and explain just a few words about who we are. First of all, we're rapidly growing in the UK. We're about to um, we're we're about to start operating internationally as well with other sites overseas. And um, it's worth mentioning that we are actually now financed by a major uh, multinational coffee trading house that's made a corporate investment in the business, which helps to explain why we're so focused on especially coffee, but other tropical agriculture species as well. We specialize in delivering what we call transactionable insights. Now, in a nutshell, that means that we take data from remote sensing means, uh, satellites and IoT, and integrate that into distributed ledger applications and, and smart contract applications. And that is really where our core value lies in being able to put these data sets into new processing methods and um, application frameworks and software. So next slide, please. Um, and, and here's an example of what we mean. This is a real life transactionable insight that we uh, enabled using our technology stack. Um, we were able to buy and procure coffee from a farm in Colombia remotely using some of our sensing techniques, contract with the farmer through a software platform, and then arrange import and logistics and everything else to get that coffee from Colombia uh, and it's green coffee format into a roasting house in, in Scotland, in, in Glasgow, actually. And, and that was a kind of big breakthrough moment for us. I have to say it was supported by Innovate UK as well. They helped to finance that technology demonstration. So let me just get that in there as well. Uh, next slide, please. And, and here are some of the underlying techniques that we used to make that happen. Um, we have highly accurate um, classification algorithms to detect coffee and other species as well. And we use that in a slightly different way to what you might have seen other people doing. So this is the sort of thing you've probably seen before. So let's move on to the next slide, please. And we are now working on ways to include new kind of insights that we can create other types of transactionable insights that are not just direct trade contracts between a producer in another part of the world and a buyer somewhere else. We're now working on how we can include sustainability insights and sustainability passporting details that allow that commodity to move through global supply chains more easily and with recognition that it is sustainable. Next slide, please. So you'll be able to see, if we move to the next slide, you'll see how we actually make use of that data in a kind of passporting sense as it follows a commodity around the world from where it travels. So this is what we're doing to collect lots of different contractual details about crops now. Next slide, please. Here is a quick snapshot of how we're looking to scale that up. So we, we trialed this, as I mentioned, in, in Colombia with a, a really small handful of farms that we prototype this approach on. We're now scaling up rapidly and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. The latest, um, Development is we're now in agreement to supply uh, this kind of service to 250,000 coffee farms in 14 different countries around the world. So since last year, this has really seen some explosive growth and approach. And um, I have to say, we are not, we don't have any data or collaborations with any Indian coffee farmers. And that's something I'd be really interested to see if anyone out there is interested in working with us on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so that, that actually leads me to a, a neat conclusion here. Um, we are looking to find quite a specific set of collaborators potentially involved in coffee in India. Coffee, that's one of, I, I'm sure you know, the rapid, most rapidly growing coffee production markets in the world is actually in India. And um, so we would love to find some partners who are interested in finding out more about what we do with connections to coffee or even other tropical agriculture species. And then um, I think that's about all I can say here for now. Um, yeah, please get in touch if you'd like to speak more. Thanks very much. 
Thank you very much, Robin. That was great. Uh, very succinct and to the point. Thank you. Um, we're now going to move on to the second theme of the workshops, which was environmental sustainability and climate resilience. And I'm very pleased to introduce Claire Hodge, who is the head of crops at Agri Epi. And um, she's going to go through the workshop um, <clears throat> uh, that we held uh, on, on them uh, and um, is going to link in you know, the uh, challenges and how those uh, relate to uh, uh, satellites and uh, Earth observation and things. Um, thank you very much, Claire. Um, um, over to you. Thanks. Them. Um, yeah, so I get the, the privilege of talking about environmental sustainability and climate resilience. Um, I think there's been a few comments in the in the box about this, and obviously it's a conversation that is happening all around the world with farmers, not just in the UK. Um, but we were able to work with stakeholders to discuss this specifically, as I think it was important. It, it connects very much with connectivity, but in its own right, it needs to be addressed. So next slide, please. So here you can see we did take a, a separate workshop to discuss how uh, agriculture specifically can deal with environmental sustainability and climate resilience. Next slide, please. So when we talked about environmental sustainability, we need to understand what that meant. And this was looking about um, production suitability. And when we when we kind of dive into what's happening in India, it's, it's a huge area. And, and in terms of agriculture, there is a vast difference across the country. And um, so what we wanted to understand was what what's growing, what will be growing and how suitable is that when we consider the environment and climate resilience. And um, we, we, we wanted to understand how to engage with, with farmers, but also the whole agricultural sector across the whole of India. Um, and what then came out of this is, is understanding more natural resources, such as water management, but also then going down to a much more granular level and understanding pest and disease and how, how that's changing for the farmers and what will make far, uh, change happen on farms to address some of these issues. And next slide, please. So I will, I will go through this fairly quickly just to make sure that we get into the detail of the businesses that are coming up. Um, the best part of the, what we did with the workshops is we had a big overview of who was involved and, and the, the different sectors involved in there. So we had um, private companies, public sector, university, finance and consulting. This was really important to be able to understand how people take on information and how that, uh, that network of people is impacting the environment and, and really how well people make change happen. Next slide, please. So we did look at the grand challenges and really what comes out here is labor, productivity, environment and technology. When it comes down to these big challenges, it's all about efficiency and productivity. Farmers and industry need to make money out of what's happening. Um, India is clearly a really huge opportunity in terms of the food basket, in terms of what they can produce. Again, the, the benefits of having lots of different climates, lots of different soil types, lots of different even altitudes is huge for food production. And, and so understanding what's happening across there is important, but then understanding how we make that efficient and productive alongside each other, which will then help us understand how to make impact in terms of environmental impact and um, sustainability. And, and obviously the question did come in about carbon. This is, this is one of the key factors people are using to trigger these changes. And it's one tool that can be used, it's a big tool, but it's one that really can uh, make a difference. But we've got to understand what does that mean to the farmer? What does it mean to the product? And what does it mean to the whole supply chain? So then once we, if we go down to the next uh, slide, please. We got into the nitty gritty of what does this mean for farmers and where are the big opportunities in agriculture. Um, clearly the environment is massive, but we have, we have some challenges within there and understanding how we can use technology, how we can use satellite information to plan, to program, to forecast. 
Um, so stubble burden is still an issue across there and creates a huge problem for air quality. We've got methane emissions, we've got high fertilizer usage, which creates impact in terms of leaching and also costs, it's costs increase. We've got changes happening in there. So trying to package that up and understand what tools do farmers need? What, how does that impact the business? How does that impact change in terms of action that are taken on farm? And what technology can be used to change that? Um, we also look at, um, again, it's a huge country, there's national policy and there's national regulation, but also there's, there's uh, communities who take different action and different processes, and also the, the counties take different regulation as well, especially when it comes to water uh, use. So we've got a lot in there in terms of the environment, and there's lots and lots of opportunities. Um, if we're going to talk about the opportunities, you have to really take on the supply chain and traceability and understand who takes on that responsibility of action and action of change. So we, we had a lot of conversations about how do you create um, traceability within that product and, and make sure the quality is understood all the way through the supply chain. So clearly there's huge opportunities in tracking that, tracing that, and making sure that the consumer is all the way connected to the farmer and you can understand the changes that happen within that. Um, next slide, please. And then this is where it gets exciting for me because you get down into the detail. So agronomy, understanding how you can help map uh, disease and um, uh, pest uh, mapping and not just understand where it is, start to take into information in terms of climate, uh, weather, and then help farmers empower them to make change uh, to action change on farm. So understanding how you can use some of that forecasting, how you can make some decision tools to help uh, farmers use that. And a lot of what we understood as well was that we need to make that easy and accessible for farmers. So a lot of it's on phones. Um, a lot of it is about sharing knowledge exchange networks and being able to really empower people to, to use the information and not just see nice, pretty dashboards. It's about how do you make that, that a useful tool for people on the ground to use. Again, we've got water usage. So that's looking at irrigation, that um, water is a, a shared resource when we think about farming. And so how do you understand that to make people, um, or help people work in collaboratively and make sure you mitigate any risk in terms of the environment and that, that will be looking a lot at irrigation and, and water efficiency. And then also uh, leaching as well can be an issue there. And then climate change is, is helping understand you know, the planting dates are so critical in farming to make sure that you, you get the crop in at the right time and you maximise its potential output. But helping farmers who experience change, but helping them understand how do you how do you use that information and how do you get those dates, change those dates, understand how the, the crop is, is responding differently to previous practices. And then obviously then you go into the harvest and you yield and, and look at that. And then and then finally on the, the big detail that came out of our section in the environment was looking at labour and robotics. And, and the, the labour resource on farms in India is changing. And we, that came across very clearly in our, our workshop. So understanding how you can change those jobs, how you can help people um, want to come into the sector as well, that it's not just, um, you know, there's been a mass exodus of, of people wanting to work on farms, not just across all across the world, but also in, in, in India. And so the use of um, tools to make labor use more efficient, but also introducing robotics in there as well. So um, to kind of conclude, uh, the environment and sustainability is a huge issue, but a huge opportunity for India, as they are a, a, a big food producing nation. And, and we've been given loads of kind of questions and challenges to take that forward. And I'm looking forward to the three companies we've got to follow on from me, who will start to identify how we can actually use this information and make, make farming in India a, a real, um, pioneer in, in, in using these tools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. That's brilliant. Um, moving on swiftly um, to um, the uh, showcase section and um, Jacqueline Spears from uh, Hummingbird is going to describe uh, what they've been doing um, in um, MRV, monitoring, reporting and verification. Over to you, Jackie, all the best. Thanks very much, Sam. I'm Jackie Spears. I am the sustainability manager at Hummingbird Technologies. So I'm just gonna give you guys kind of a whistle stop tour into what we do here. Um, next slide, please. 
So Hummingbird is an imagery analytics company, um, which means that we use big data and machine learning to develop models that can detect regenerative agriculture. Now, this is all done using satellite imagery. Um, obviously, we've, we've talked a lot of today about the massive scalability benefits that come from satellite imagery. So we're really leveraging that with our tech. And really what our models are doing is allowing regenerative practices to be verified and scaled through a number of different channels. Next slide, please. So MRV, uh, monitoring, reporting and verification is required for a number of different industries. So we're working with agri-food supply chains, uh, carbon markets, ag lenders, landowners, and of course governments as well. And really what MRV does is it delivers competence and credibility to data that's being self-reported. We all know that the stakes are really high to get this right. We need to get Regen Ag right. And so because of that, we need to make sure that we're validating it. Of course, there's also big benefits to farmers as well because MRV is a requirement for really any of these industries. Supplying this service essentially unlocks monetization routes through all of those different channels that I just listed before. Next slide, please. So our core capabilities are really geared around the practices that have the largest impact on agricultural health. Namely, those would be tillage, um, cover crops, and crop rotations. Now, these practices all have a really big effect on carbon. Carbon is obviously kind of the favorite child these days, um, and it's an important thing in terms of climate change, of course, but also there's a lot of other benefits that come from these practices as well. So biodiversity, um, reduced pollution, climate resilience, kind of the list goes on and on. Um, next slide, please. So this is a, a, a wordy slide, but really it's just an explanation of kind of how we build our tech. So we build our models by taking thousands of ground truth data points. So we have people who are out in the field recording what's actually happening in real life. We are corresponding all of that data to satellite images. And then slowly we're training our models over time with more and more data. Of course, the more data we get, the, the better our accuracy is. And the point of, of this is really that eventually we don't need anyone on the ground. We're able to just verify everything completely remotely. Uh, next slide, please. So this is really just a snapshot into kind of what our user journey would look like. Um, the use of satellites for this type of tech is really, really vital for scalability. It's really just not viable for geographies like India, for example, to be able to send out someone into the field every single year to see what has happened here. Um, it's just not cost and time effective to do it that way. The other benefit from this is that we can look back in time using satellite images. So we can see over the past, you know, whatever, five, 10 years, what has happened? What has been the land use change? Have the management practices changed over time? For mechanisms like carbon markets, farmers need to be able to display that they've changed practices over time in, in order to receive money and um, through, through carbon credits. So, the historic piece is really important as well. Um, from our end, we're always really excited to be pushing into new geographies. As soon as we find a partner who's really keen to take on Regen Ag in a, in a big way, we're excited to co-develop with them. Um, because of kind of the, the nuances of agriculture and geography, every new geography we go into, we do need to train our models to make sure that they are performing to a really high degree of accuracy. Again, the stakes are high and we need to make sure that we're validating um, to a degree that we can all be really comfortable with. So our goal is to get to wall to wall coverage around the globe eventually. It's gonna take a few years for us to get there, but that is our plan. Um, next slide, please. And that is, really us. Um, the text there is, is quite dark, but I will just pop my email address into the chat here. 
always happy to, to talk more about this in a bit more detail in the future. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Jackie. That's great. Um, I, and I'm going to move swiftly on to try and um, <laughs> make up time. Uh, hi, Jim. Um, um, great to um, see you again uh, and um, look forward to uh, what you have to say. All the best. Yes. Uh, thanks, Sam. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, could we have the next slide, please? We'll move fairly quickly through these because I'm aware you're over against the time. Um, Soil Essentials is, a, is actually a pretty... Uh, a, a unique company in a way because we come from an agricultural background. Uh, the directors are all are all involved in production agriculture, but we've been a, lo a long established company. We've been uh, involved in precision agriculture on, uh, for about well, about twenty four years now, I think, really, right from the first in, uh, first initial uh, uh, start of the technology. We have actually uh, three divisions, precision agronomy, software development and research projects and machine control. I'm going to specifically speak about the second one, the software development and research projects, but it, we don't think you can have each one in isolation. They, they, have, uh, they all affect one another. Agriculture is a very complicated system. And so that uh, you have to have a pretty broad and, and in-depth understanding of these the uh, of the systems agricultural system before you can um, before you can accurately make these uh, some of these tools and, and models next slide please we work with lots of people right right throughout the world and a, a lot of do a lot of um, projects with, with commercial projects but also research and development projects next slide please and we do work worldwide, uh, just depends on what is needed in which area. And next slide, please. So the precision agronomy side is, is very much a focus on detecting, the, detecting and predicting and correcting, if possible, the spatial variation in things like soil chemistry, soil biology and soil texture. Now that, that might be mapping it, that might be uh, remote, uh, modeling it, uh, uh, that might be sampling it, or it might be uh, it might be combining all uh, all those together, and uh, uh, and actually making a recommendation on on how to correct it. Next slide, please. But the key part I think here really is that we've got to take data that data down the left hand side, satellite data, drone data, soil sampling data. A lot of these are very useful in their own rights, but they absolutely uh, don't hold the whole uh, picture. What we, so what we do is we built a software platform and a set of models incorporated in that software platform to take the raw data down the left-hand side and put them and transform them into something that's actually useful and, and valuable to, to farmers, to companies, and, and to uh, other stakeholders, really. So on the right-hand side, we have various tools that we have to predict soil health. We have tools to predict potato uh, crop yield, soil moisture, things like this. Keep on going. So one of the tools that we wanted to talk about was soil carbon modeling. This is something we've been working on for a number of years now. It's driven from, the, uh, from our initial uh, our interest in crop yield monitoring. So th this is a quite a well uh, evolved product now. We've got a fairly good uh, process and a fairly good methodology. One thing is that we're we're much more focused on a, a mechanistic model type rather, rather than a, a we do have a, a, a part an AI system, but we tend to use a mechanistic model because we seem to get we we, we can address uh, in more detail the variability of of fields. Uh, but this process is is all driven by an in depth knowledge of agronomy, how plants grow, and how the soil responds to 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 weather and how plants grow. Next slide, please. And we do have the process. The process is complicated. Agriculture is complicated, and we tend to uh, model each part of the the process in and calculating what what each part plays and how the outputs come. Next slide, please. 
And the prime, there can be many, many different outputs, but we we can't output any one of these uh, any one of these attributes from root depth to yield to light interception, round to the to the other side of the equation when we're for the environmental sides we're, we're much more interested in biomass and carbon production and nitrogen uptake and nitrogen leaching perhaps nitrogen loss and and, and soil water contents and all of these are attributes that we can that the model outputs keep on going please um we can do this over a large scale as well so we can do it either within fields and daily with daily, daily values or a field average timeline or in a five-year rotation or and in real time keep on going please and in this example, you see uh, the the trajectory of soil uh, of soil the dry matter in soil the the uh, soil carbon content over five years and how it responds to different types of crops and when they grow. Next slide, please. We have to validate this. Validation is immensely important, and it's validated against uh, local data, for example, uh, yield monitor data or or Weybridge data. And next slide, please. And that allows us, and this is a, allows us to output various attributes. And this is a graph of how the changes in dynamics in soil organic matter content, the nitrogen mineralization, uh, and, and the nitrogen uptake, uh, and the ultimate response of the soil organic matter content in tons per hectare on the secondary y-axis um, over a period from 2015 to 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, ultimately, it gives you then an output in the carbon balance, i.e. the additional loss in tons per hectare between 2015 and 2020. Each one uh, is, uh, is uh, calculated on a grid, and we can see that in some fields, the green fields, we've, we've gained five to seven tons per hectare of dry matter. Uh, in other fields, we've just stayed, stayed the same. And there's a reason behind uh, all these figures, and we can see why that is. Next slide, please. So uh, what we've built is a precision ag toolbox that can be tailored with, uh, with to suit the, the, the requirements of the companies or farmers who are using it worldwide. Next slide, please. And uh, one specific example of a tool set is the soil health, soil carbon, soil water, soil nitrogen model that I've just demonstrated, which works from a subfield level to a landscape scale and produces maps of all the major crop biophysical parameters and, and water leaching events. And we use this to target soil carbon and soil health sampling and use it to validate those samples. And that's us, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. And um, sorry you're um, under um, <laughs> time pressure. Thank you very much. Um, brilliant. Um, I, I'm going to move over to uh, Kavida, who are going to talk about the use of digital twins in uh, this area, uh, and over to you, um, uh, um, and I'll go to, um, Sumit. Thanks, thanks. So hi, everyone. This is Sumit, uh, co-founder and CEO of Kavida. Uh, personally, I've done my bachelor's from the Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, back in India, and then a PhD from Warwick in digital twins. So uh, at Kavita, essentially, we build digital twins of supply chains to make sure that your supply chains is, is protected against various disruptions. Uh, next slide, please. So a digital twin is a virtual replica of anything. Uh, specifically, we do it for supply chains. Next slide, please. To make sure that all your suppliers, all your uh, farms, making sure that the whole value chain starting from the farm to the consumer is monitored for various threats and disruptions. Next slide, please. Uh, the way we do it is that we take internal operational data within ERP system. So this can be supplier locations, commodities that the company is dealing with. And then we link this with all of this external risk data in, on, on the open web, as well as through various external APIs. So this can be Twitter, Facebook, local news channels, specific news channels, global news channels, satellite imaging data. Um, and then we establish this link using locations, using commodity names to make sure that you have an early warning about which disruptions can affect your supplier or your farm, which orders can be delayed, and then what would be the impact of the delay. So 
we essentially quantify impact in terms of delays and make sure that it helps optimize your day-to-day -day operations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the AI looks specifically at four to five categories, so delay, supply, market, compliance, and environmental being the most critical ones that uh, affect supply chains on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we're also dealing with ESG risks to make sure that any form of risks regarding forced labor, regarding any of pollution issues are captured within the value chain or within the supply chain. Next slide, please. And the whole point of this is to make sure that you get real-time risk detection and hence you can take mitigation, de mitigation decisions that you couldn't have if you had come to know about the risk much later. Next slide, please. So next slide, please. So one of the case studies that uh, we did, how the platform would have worked is that recently there had been a Yanshan port disruption that was uh, for all the shipments coming out of China because of which there was a big bottleneck in the whole supply chain regarding semiconductors, regarding uh, various commodities that are required uh, for manufacturing. And the port closed on 24th and um, the response of the manufacturers or the people who were affected were much later in June 15th. But then how would you have responded had the twin been there? Next slide, please. So this whole, the whole complexity, the whole challenge is that there is a very long detection to decision making time. And the goal of the twin is to reduce that as much as possible. Next slide, please. Next slide. So the first information about this, uh, about this disruption came out in Guangdong. So there had been a local case in Guangdong, which was published in the news media. Now, Guangdong is still not where the ancient port is located, but again, uh, this is the first risk that there is something that can affect your shipments. Next slide, please. It was then confirmed that those two cases were from the ancient port, the district that is uh, where the port is located. And knowing anything about China's zero COVID policy, it would be uh, obvious that the port is now going to be closed. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, on 24th May, the port announced on its WeChat channel that the ports are going to close and all the customers and all the freights would be uh, stranded and there wouldn't be any operations conducted, being conducted. Next slide, please. So essentially, the, the point is that there was all of this external data that could have helped you in your decision making that could have helped you kind of plan a mitigation decisions regarding social media, online media. But uh, since all of that is not integrated, this all of this is external and everything that you're doing within a supply chain is internal, that link is not there. The whole point of Kavita is to make sure that it is that that link exists and you know exactly which piece of information or which piece, piece of news or which piece of social media is going to actually affect your suppliers and orders. Next slide. And we make sure that um, the whole point of detecting is being able to communicate it easily. So not only do you want to detect, you want to collaborate with the stakeholders to make sure that they get a very good idea about what can happen, you give it to them. So the whole platform looks at first detecting and then collaborating with the stakeholders, maybe a supplier, maybe a farm and communicating to them as soon as possible that this risk has been detected and we need to take, some, we need to take an urgent action. Next slide, please. Um, it's a multi-channel communication platform that makes sure that you can communicate through email, WhatsApp, WeChat, voice message, whichever is most convenient, given that a lot of farms, a lot of uh, uh, stakeholders are in very remote locations who may or may not have access to uh, a computer or a good internet connection. Next slide, please. Yes, we also make sure that in case you're dealing with logistics, transportation of the issue, you link it with satellite imaging data so as to make sure that you get real-time expected arrival dates for all these, uh, for all your orders and all your suppliers. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a brief idea about the risks that you could have picked up. So for example, this was the, the, the order coming out of China. There was Twitter news about a typhoon. There was Twitter news about a power outage. There was Twitter news about uh, changes in import in import chaos. So all of this intelligence would have been picked up, tagged to that purchase order or tagged to the supplier because he was located in Ningbo. Next slide, please. Similarly, uh, everything that can happen, uh, Omicron, our first risk signal was detected in August back when there was a small news article coming out of South Africa that has been certain detections. So make sure that all of this data gets to you as soon as possible if you had anything coming out of from that part of the world. Next slide, please. Yes, the whole goal of the platform is to make sure that your detection to decision making time is very small, be it detection or be it communicating to the required stakeholders and it kind of takes care of that whole end-to-end -end value chain. Next slide, please. 
that's all. Thank you very much, um, Summit. Uh, let me get my, um, oh, sorry, I'm trying to. <laughs> okay, my, um, I'm gonna hand over, I can't get my video to, to come on. So over to uh, Lorenzo Conti from uh, Crover uh, for their um, grain storage uh, monitoring technology, which is um, uh, uh, of great interest. Over to you, uh, Lorenzo. Thank you, Sam, for the introduction. So at Crover, we're focused around the world's first the subterranean drone, or a Crover, as we call it, as there is no dictionary word to describe a device that is able to fluently swim through assemblies of solid particles, anything from sand dunes to bulk, mineral bulks to grain bulks, which is really our focus right now. Uh, next slide, please. So we've been talking today uh, about a lot of the different stages of the grain supply chain, uh, specifically for, uh, you know, focusing on crops, but a lot of people don't realize the many stages that are involved in getting uh, grain from, uh, uh, from the field onto uh, the table. So here's a quick overview. Next slide, please. And so far, we've mostly been focused on uh, addressing uh, integrated pest management uh, during uh, the storage of cereal grains, primarily off-farm storage. So when uh, uh, grain is stored in large quantities and for long periods of time in units like silos and sheds, although sometimes it is done in loose bulks as well. Next slide, please. So we're really focused in uh, kind of addressing the main bottleneck in the post-harvest and then pre-shelf uh, uh, stage of that uh, supply chain. As storage still represents today the single phase with the highest post-harvest losses uh, before consumption. Next slide, please. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously these numbers are significantly skewed uh, by losses in developing countries, but even if we look at the UK, and, uh, and other developed areas, usually the losses range uh, between 5 to 15%, uh, even if you have a proper uh, storage unit. Next slide, please. So when you're storing large quantities of grain in Unix, like silos and sheds, a lot of things can go wrong if you don't maintain the temperature and moisture of the grain appropriately. Primarily, uh, high temperature and high moisture can lead to the growth of infestations like insects and molds, which damage the grain, um, decreasing their quality, and in some cases, making them unsuited for consumption. Next slide. Also, the way grain storage management is done at the moment is pretty labor intensive, usually requiring a person to physically walk on top of the grain bulk, which is very tiring, time consuming, and also not safe to do, because if you sink in the grain, there's nothing that can save you, really. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, over the years, there's been a growing regulatory pressure to move away from the traditional way of doing things towards what people call integrated pest management practices, which really mean keeping an accurate eye on the temperature and moisture of the grain and uh, acting on it uh, in a timely manner to maintain those two parameters within a safe threshold that prevents pest growth. Next slide, please. So we usually say that grain storage units, next slide, are a bit like uh, um, a black box. You can measure fairly well what quality is going in and as you're taking it out, so as grains are flowing, but while they're sitting static in there, there is very few things that someone can do to assess their quality. Next slide, please. So here's a quick overview of kind of most of the existing solutions at the moment. You've got the, the one on the left, which is the one most used in cases where people do anything at all, which is really a, a person walking with a heavy end spear on top of the green bulk and uh, uh, taking samples of dimensions and set a few points uh, where they can reach. Um, and then you've got on the right, a kind of more advanced uh, systems that are really static sensing solutions, usually taking the shape of a long cable with a few sensors down the length of that cable. Next slide, please. And uh, the only real innovation in the space over the last years has been uh, adding wireless data transfer capability to these devices that still needs to be fixed to something, whether it is a cable or a metal bracket on the walls to make sure that they don't get lost in the middle of the green bulk. Next slide, please. So we've uh, we've been developing um, that uh, you know that Crover Robo, that world's first uh, subterranean drone, and equipped it with temperature moisture sensors, so that it measures these two parameters as it fluently swims through the grain bulk, uh, building a three D map of conditions within the grain. 
but also helping maintain its quality directly by providing in situ mixing of the grain as it's moving through it, which improves its aeration and also avoids problems like crusting on the surface. Next slide, please. So here's just a little bit more of uh, videos of the deck rover uh, in action. Uh, we're working, we've been working with uh, AgriAppi also on a kind of sampling version of the Crover Robo, which we are showcasing uh, next week uh, to a selected list of attendees. And uh, uh, really, you know, I started off with a big claim that the Crover is the world's first subterranean drone. So just to touch a little bit more on why that is the case. Uh, we, we started off of the back of the discovery of a novel physical effect, which makes it possible to move through these type of environments, which are generally unfeasible to move through through classical methods, uh, uh, be it you know, ondulatory motion or peristaltic motion or any other classical method. Uh, in short, we discovered that there is a coupling between rotational motion and translation motion in granular media. Uh, so not just grain, but any other uh, granular environment. Uh, be, be sand or, or mineral bulks. And uh, we've already been granted a UK patent on the core Crover technology. So on anything that moves through a granular bulks as a result of rotation in a direction, merely perpendicular to the axial rotation. And we've got international patent filings across the world uh, in countries, including uh, India as well. Next slide, please. So here's a quick overview of the, the current Crover system. You've got the, the Crover robot, the core of it. Uh, the data is then uh, uh, you know, uh, sent to a local control unit and then uh, wirelessly over to a, a central gateway where you've got one per site. Uh, then you know, we, we are talking here about satellites. So obviously we added a, a, satellite, a SATCOM uh, uh, data transfer component to the system. Uh, whereby if mobile data or Wi-Fi are not available on site, as some of the other presenters were mentioning earlier, that is uh, sometimes the case in rural areas, then we've also got a SATCOM module that gets the data uh, safely over to our secure database so that users can visualize it on our uh, web-based app. Next slide, please. Um, now, uh, while our focus has been uh, on grain storage so far, uh, there are many future applications that we, we are uh, we're aiming to explore, going from uh, um, underground sampling and exploration on Mars and other planets to helping in the uh, chemical industry and with mineral bulks. Next slide, please. But our focus right now is still on, uh, on the grain supply chain, and when I was asked to, uh, you know, to present for this event, uh, um, you know, it would be, uh, I added something on the kind of soil side of things as well. Uh, next slide, uh, where the Crover can potentially be applied as well. Next slide, please. So the, the very first Crover that we ever built was actually uh, tested in, uh, uh, in dry silica sand. So that's the video that you see in there. Uh, it was kind of really the, the very initial, the, the very first test that we did, just showing that it could uh, move uh, with a very simple shape uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in dry sand. Uh, we've done uh, kind of more tests on a variety of, uh, of granular bolts uh, of different sizes and, and shapes. So we're pretty confident they can move in, in all sort of dry matter. Uh, things get a little bit more complicated if there are kind of chemical bonds in there. So the, the soil has to be, uh, you know, basically not, uh, not cemented. Uh, but if it is loose soil, then we can theoretically move through it. And, uh, and hence the, this can be fairly interesting for, for applications on, on crops and on monitoring the, the condition of, of soils or even just planting seeds. Um, something that we've been working on is also a, a kind of novel, novel sensor to uh, provide additional uh, readings that can be interesting both for crops in storage, but also in soils uh, with a focus starting on uh, mycotoxins and protein content, but potentially expandable to, uh, to other readings as well. Next slide, please. Um, now, you know, we are, we are talking about uh, food losses and preventing these losses. So obviously, uh, the social and environmental angle is a key uh, focus for us. 
uh, you've got the fact that um, grain storage currently accounts for about 6% of total greenhouse gas emissions from food waste. And on the farm side, uh, the losses are, are even higher. So being able to tap into that and improve the efficiency of that grain supply chain is a, is a key thing that we're working on, uh, primarily uh, taking the angle of integrated pest management uh, uh, practices. Uh, also, we've got the problem that about one quarter of the world food supply is contaminated by mycotoxins, which are developed by some types of molds. And so uh, making sure that a grain uh, doesn't get spoiled and uh, toxic substances like that develop is, uh, is a primary focus for us. Um, so this is really an overview of what we do. We'd be happy to, uh, uh, next slide, by the way. Uh, we, we'd be happy to, uh, you know, talk with anyone uh, that has any, uh, you know, interest in, uh, in partnering with us, with, uh, uh, you know, wh where they think that uh, Crover and our technology can add a significant value. Uh, next slide, please. So here you've got my contact details and feel free to reach out. Um, th and thanks for having us. Thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, and apologies that we've uh, overrun, but um, yeah, over to you, Patrick, in terms of next steps. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam, and thank you for all of you for staying on after the we run over here, but much appreciated, and thank you to all our speakers and presenters today. Um, just to quote very quickly then, the next steps from here. So as mentioned, this is part of a project we're doing on behalf of UKR Innovate UK, and we're working with FCDO in India and DIT colleagues. So we now need to uh, complete the roadmap and suggestions recommendations following the workshops and the bilateral uh, report bilateral event we've had today and submit that report to include feedback from yourselves as well. Um, so it's really important that you do complete that post event survey to let us know which areas that you're interested in. Um, Catapult will be providing these conclusion recommendations for next steps and uh, the slides will be available on request. Uh, so please get in touch if you'd like to know more or would you like access to the slides. Um, so please complete the post event survey, let us know which areas you're interested in. As Sam mentioned at the very beginning, um, we want to make sure that this, is a, this isn't just another bilateral event or another, uh, another Zoom session that you come to, but we've got some actionable insights and intelligence coming out of this that we're really hoping to take into the next FY uh, with your support. So thank you very much. Next slide, please, Manoa. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll leave the chat, we'll leave the call open for another couple of minutes so you can add any questions we'll be publishing a blog after this which will answer the questions there as we run over so please do submit any questions in the q a and chat function we'll then feed them through to speakers and presenters and get back to you later on through the blog post so we'll leave this open for a little bit longer but thank you very much for joining enjoy the rest of your afternoon and morning and do get in touch with any further questions thank you very much <laughs>